So now we are uh, about to start uh, the seminar. Professor Kanto is going to be uh, the chair for this first day seminar, but he's going to be also the first speaker. So I'm really glad to introduce him uh, in this first day. Uh, I also would like to say that Professor Kurt is one of my supervisors as Professor Alvis as well here. So I'm glad to introduce him today. Professor Kurt is the director of the Aerospace Research and Innovation Research Center in Abu Dhabi uh, and the Associate Dean for Research and Professor in Aerospace Engineering in Khalifa University here in Abu Dhabi as well. He received his bachelor degree in aeronautical engineer from University of Southampton, and his master and PhD in aeronautical engineer also in Imperial College in UK. He then worked in the Department of Materials at the Ecole Polytechnique Federal of Lausanne for nine years, and as lecturer, reader, and professor at the University of Liverpool for 18 years. He joined Khalifa University in 2012 to direct the Aerospace Research and Innovation Research uh, Center. This research center is a joint effort between Khalifa University, Mubadala, and supports the manufacturing operations at Strata, an aerostructure company. Wesley Cantor's research interests are in composite materials, additive manufacturing, and the impact response of structure and smart material. So again, I'm glad to introduce Professor Curtin. So now I'm gonna leave uh, the okay. seminar. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much for the night, Professor. Thank you, thank you for that uh, introduction. I'm so glad to be with you. I've just given the title of my talk a, a general title uh, and it reflects some of the activities over the last 10 or 12 years. So I call it size effects in the quasi static and dynamic properties of lightweight structures. And as uh, we just heard, I'm at uh, Khalifa University uh, in the Aerospace Research and Innovation Center. Um, I guess we have quite a few colleagues here from the UAE, so you'll be familiar with Khalifa University, but for those that aren't and haven't visited, uh, this is a photo of our downtown campus um, where um, I'm uh, actually located. I don't know if you can see my uh, arrow there, but this is the engineering building. Uh, this is a, a, a new campus uh, that was built, has been built over the last four or five years. Our old campus is off to the far right, which we still use. And uh, we have a second campus that is 13 uh, kilometers away, just on the outskirts uh, of Abu Dhabi as well. So uh, there's a photo there showing the inside of the university now, because uh, it's new, it's quite modern uh, and uh, so uh, I'm the director of the Aerospace Research and Innovation Center and that was really my or the main reason for coming to the UAE back in 2012 and it was to build a, a research center uh, mainly for research on composite materials and when I arrived back in 2012 uh, that was the sort of space that I was given and uh, told to go and build a, a research center there so uh, after some struggles with builders and building regulations and so on and so forth. Some two and a half years later, we completed our research lab. This is before we moved the equipment in. I show it to you to give an idea of the space. This is the main hall. Um, and off the main hall, we have a, a layup uh, room. At the back, we have a machine shop. And behind the photographer here, there's another lab where we have our robotics equipment in there. This is a, um, our large KUKA robot uh, on a seven meter rail that we use for drilling. Uh, we have uh, various pieces of equipment. This was our autoclave being installed. We have XCT. And uh, so we, uh, we have a range of manufacturing and characterization equipment, as well as uh, additive manufacturing equipment that I will show you uh, very shortly. So what I wanted to talk about today was really some of the work that uh, uh, I've been involved with uh, over the years, uh, looking at uh, size effects in uh, scaling effects in uh, lightweight materials and structures. Um, so the, the aim of the, this is to use geometrically similar scaling laws to study and understand size effects 
in the properties of a range of materials, including hybrid materials. And we'll be hearing more about uh, fiber metal laminates during the uh, course of the next couple of days, sandwich structures, plain composites, and also additively manufactured structures such as lattice structures. In terms of the, the scaling work, um, the many people have been uh, working in this area uh, over the years. Um, some early work, certainly on composite materials, was done by John Morton. I had the good fortune to be one of John's uh, first PhD students when he was still at Imperial College. He then moved to uh, NASA and ultimately onto Virginia Tech and was working on scaling and impact loaded uh, carbon fiber composites and published a very nice paper in AI, AA uh, journal back in 88. And um, then a number of years later, um, after Switzerland, I moved to Liverpool University where I had the good fortune to work alongside Norman Jones. Many of you will know Norman, of course, very well known in the area of impact and energy absorption. And uh, he'd been working on scaling uh, as well uh, for many years. And I just cited that, <coughs> excuse me, a very nice paper that he wrote uh, with Wen on uh, scaling in aluminium and mild steel plates. So if you look at both of those papers, it gives sort of a background to the approach and the approach I'm talking about today. They both use the Buckingham Pie theory. Um, they uh, involved identifying input and response parameters. In, for impact, for example, input parameters might be your impact energy, your impact the mass, um, or your support conditions, plate size, et cetera, et cetera. Your response parameters might be force, uh, displacement, time. And uh, both of them generated uh, dimensionless Buckingham Pie uh, groups and then use them to identify scale factors associated with each of the uh, input and response parameters, as you'll see shortly. But th those are two good papers to, to, to sort of get a, um, a, a sort of an understanding of uh, some of the great work that's been done uh, in the past. Um, much of our early work, and this really goes back over a decade, focused on fiber metal laminates, and we've got colleagues here from Cape Town, I think, and Genevieve is joining us from Sheffield. Uh, we were involved with, uh, with those guys doing a lot of the work on FMLs. This is a project that was funded by EPSRC and we were looking at uh, scaling effects in fiber metal laminates based on a self-reinforced polypropylene composite and an aluminum alloy. Um, there I've shown um, a sort of schematic. There's our that would be our aluminium sheets, top and bottom, and then we've got our composite plies at 0 and 90. Between them, we bond them together and we get our baseline <laughs> structure there. Now we can scale that in two ways. One of them is called ply level and the other is called sublaminate level. Ply level involves just taking, for example, the top skin of that and changing or increasing the size of that and sim doing a similar uh, approach with the core. So if we adopt four scale sizes, I'll be referring to these throughout. Let's assume it's a quarter scale, half, three quarters, and our full scale, n equals one sample. If this was our quarter scale sample here, our full scale, n equals one uh, structure would have skins that are four times the thickness of that. So we'd increase the thickness dramatically. So the core that's four times that, uh, and you can see it's sort of shown schematically. So that's our ply level uh, scaled system. And our sublaminate level scaled uh, structure is shown here. And that is made just by bonding additional baseline laminates one on top of the other. So there our N equals one, our full scale structure would have four of those bonded together. And you can see that shown schematically there. In what I'm going to talk about in the next few slides, focus very much on this because it's, I think it's more appropriate and exact um, uh, approach to adopt. Um, so I, I won't go into all the sort of quasi-static tests we do, but I just show you this to give you an example of what the approach involves. So we're doing uh, scaling analysis. We have our scaled specimens here, all geometrically scaled. So our length, width and thickness scaled, uh, as, uh, as I've just mentioned. But we also have to scale our test rigs uh, as well. And for flectoral tests, one has to scale those accurately. That involves scaling the support diameters and the span. 
And of course, as I mentioned, the sample has to be scaled as well. And we also have to scale our crosshead displacement rate uh, to achieve the same strain rates throughout. So you can see four samples there that have uh, been tested in Fletcher. We do the same, we've done the same intention for a wide range of different FML systems. I won't go into any detail here, but you can see the four types of tensile sample there from the quarter all the way to the n equals one sample, similar sort of failure modes in each. And these, this graph here just shows the stress as a function of scale size, not only for the FML there in the middle, but also for the uh, aluminium and the plain composite as well. If you just look at the aluminium, for example, you can see there's quite a variation there just going across the four scale sizes. That really it just amounts to an issue with getting um, aluminium that's appropriately scaled uh, in terms of its thickness. One ends up going to different suppliers to get the same grade of aluminium and uh, invariably exhibits slightly different properties and that's reflected here. And it's also then reflected in the FMLs. But um, so uh, some of the effects you see are largely due to that. But what I really wanted to talk about today was more on, on impact and uh, not just FMLs, but composites, sandwich structures, as well. And as uh, I said, I'll close with some additive manufacturing. So this is a photo of our impact rig at Liverpool University, one that we had made many years ago. Simple sort of drop weight rig, a couple of meters there. The, the beauty of the rig was you could adjust the width of the guides. And when you, anyone that's done work on scaling knows that uh, your impact masses can uh, grow very large very quickly. Uh, and uh, so you end up dropping many, many tens of kilos. So you need a fairly versatile rig, uh, and you can see it there. We initially started using a laser Doppler velocimeter, but then we moved on to a high-speed camera when they became widely available and we got some money. Uh, I mentioned the scale factors earlier, and we can identify them, but the scale factors for things like striker diameter, plate thickness, and the support radius are, are fairly straightforward. So they need to scale with the scale size. So you need four scale sizes of, of uh, support, circular supports and uh, strikers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the impact mass now should scale as N cubed. And that's where your impact masses rapidly escalate out of all proportion. Because if you're using one kilogram on your N equals quarter plate, you need 64 kilograms to test your largest plate. So you then, uh, uh, then things become rather challenging. The response parameters are four should scale as n squared, and you'll see in the future figures coming up that I normalize a force by that and our deflection by n. So that, uh, this figure, uh, I'll just show it very quickly, just summarizes our four scale sizes, a panel in this case. There's our largest one, 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters, seven millimeters thickness fairly substantial plate, quite expensive to manufacture as well. So if we can get the same response from something like that, we can save a, a lot of money uh, in due course. So uh, we go ahead and, uh, and test them, we impact them. So we take our four scale sizes and we have our four sizes of support and striker, diameter, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and uh, sorry about that, we measure our force against displacement. And we've got our four different sizes of sample in there. There's our N equals quarter. The smallest one, clearly it's a very small sample impacted by a, a low energy. Uh, and we get this response down here, maximum force, sort of two kilonewtons and a little bit more. There's our uh, half, N equals half, three quarters and our full size. Now, as I mentioned before, we normalize our force by the n squared, our scale size squared, and our displacement by n. And when we do that, we find that all of our traces collapse neatly one on top of the other. And we get a, a, a very nice response there where our n equals quarter sample is giving a response that is uh, very similar to our much larger plate. There's uh, some dynamic effects occurring here at the beginning uh, due to the very high uh, forces that the load cell is experiencing. But, uh, but very uh, encouraging there. You can see the plates there in the top right-hand corner, and you can see they've been uh, indented there. But if you look at the, the plates there, you can sort of see at least qualitatively that the, 
the level of damage is similar in them all. But the, the proof of the pudding really is uh, in sectioning the samples, looking at the damage within them and, uh, and comparing them. So here we have two different impact energies, uh, 302 n cubed joules and 403. If you take these sections on the left-hand side, this is our n equals one sample subjected to 302 joules. Um, it's uh, got um, um, a little bit of damage here in the composite. You can see some sort of thinning here in the aluminium layers as well. And if you look at the other scale sizes as well, you see similar types of damage there. You can see this sort of thinning uh, here in the aluminium. And you can even see a small damage there in the N equals quarter sample that's been subjected to an impact energy of only five joules. So, um, but still this uh, 302 N cubed joules. So this is a much lower energy, but the same scaled energy. And we're getting very similar levels of damage. And go a little bit higher, 403 N cubed joules. Again, we can see similar failure mechanisms in all four scale sizes, fracture of the lower surface here. Uh, and some thinning, you can see this thinning of the flies more clearly here. So great similarity in terms of failure mechanisms as well. Uh, now Norman Jones in his impact uh, engineering paper, he developed a, a dimensionless impact energy and it's shown there, it's based on the actual impact energy in joules, the yield stress at that particular scale size of sample, as well as the indented diameter. We use that type of non-dimensional impact energy and plotted our non-dimensional deflections against that. And for all four scale sizes and fly level scaling, you see that they fit nicely on one figure there. And also for the sublaminate scaling, which I haven't said very much about, also reasonably good fit there. So all in all, it seems to work really quite well for these relatively complex hybrid materials, these FMLs. So when we finished that a number of years later, a um, uh, PhD student uh, at Liverpool, uh, Zewen, she uh, did some scaled impact work on um, uh, sandwich structures and they are shown here. So these were carbon fiber PMI sandwich structures uh, again, we scale the skin thickness, so you can see here, I've shown it schematically, you scale the core thickness as well. Uh, the way we did it here was to actually bond uh, cores of the same thickness together, so to increase the core thickness by bonding sheets together, but we managed to get four different size panels. These full size panels are in fact really quite large, quite expensive to produce. We did impact tests on them just as we did before, measure force against displacement. These are the normalized force, normalized displacement plots for the four scale sizes. And uh, again, there's really uh, quite a high degree of, uh, of uh, similarity of overlap there of our four traces uh, going from the quarter up to the full scale, in spite of the fact that the N equals one, as I said, is 64 times larger in terms of mass and, and volume. Uh, if we increase the energy to uh, 80, almost 82 in cube joules, we see again reasonably good similarity. Um, you have problems really when you test the very small samples, um, but you can see there's some of these effects that we get here. But nevertheless, looks pretty, uh, looks pretty uh, similar. Um, then uh, once again, when we section these samples, we see when we look at the damage. In the four scale sizes, this is n equals a quarter, half, three quarters, and n equals one, two different energies. Uh, if we look at the lower energy first, let's start with the, the largest sample here. You can see that impact has created this sort of, it's failure within the core, but very close to the top surface skin, where the local stress field has just caused some crushing here of the core, and as the skin sort of um, uh, recovers, this fails probably in tension there, but we see similar sort of failure mechanism in the smaller samples. And even if one looks very closely, uh, one convinces oneself that uh, there is a, some sort of blemish there as well, even in the N equals quarter sample. Um, 
it's perhaps clearer if we look at the higher impact energy where the indenter starts to penetrate the core and you can see here the quarter scale and compare that to the full scale sample. This one subjected to 80, almost 82 joules and this one to little over one joule, but both subjected to the same scale energy. So damage patterns and failure mechanisms appear to be similar across all the scale sizes and uh, the approach seems to have some value. So that all looked uh, pretty good. So then we sort of went on to uh, other materials as well, such as a straightforward glass fiber reinforced plastic. This was a unidirectional GFRP. Uh, the nice thing about GFRP is it's translucent and you can see the damage within it. So you don't need to rush to your ultrasonic C scanner and these sorts of things. You can see the damage quite nicely after impact. Um, so here we've got the, the usual sort of scaled force displacement plots uh, for the four scale sizes. And once again, you can see that the response is similar across the four scale sizes. If you look at the damage then, this is uh, after 51 NQ joules, um, looking at starting with the, the largest really, because the damage is clearer to see there, you can see this circular delaminated area here in the middle, quite clearly. Again, you can see uh, such damage in the three quarters and the half. And again, um, with a bit of poetic license, I think you can see some damage there in the quarter scale um, uh, as, as well. Um, so uh, if we look at the uh, higher impact energy, 150 in cube joules, it's perhaps uh, easier to see. Um, you can see uh, the largest sample here, we've got this delamination, you've got some sort of spalling as well as, as the rear surface fibers. And you see similar sort of damage levels across the four scale sizes as well. So we're getting very similar damage patterns uh, in the quarter scale sample as we do in what we term our full scale sample as well. One has to remember that this damage is three dimensional through the thickness as well. Clearly we're just seeing a two dimensional reputation, rep, a representation, but it is three dimensional through the thickness. But having said that, yeah, it, looks, uh, it looks very uh, reproducible in terms of scale size. So everything up to that point seemed you know, really uh, quite encouraging. And then we uh, encountered carbon fiber reinforced plastic. And uh, this is a, a woven laminate. It's, a, it's very much a toughened matrix and uh, it's a toughened epoxy matrix. And it generally doesn't delaminate very much when it's impacted, it fails in fiber fracture more so than delamination. Now these four sizes of panel have, have in fact been impacted and you can just about see some of the cracking there on the rear surface, but those are our foil panel sizes. Um, quite expensive when you're talking in terms of the amount of material for the larger panels. But anyway, uh, we repeat the types of tests I mentioned earlier. We get forced displacement curves that look something like that. This is our largest sample. Um, we load it up, we get some sort of oscillatory response here. Then we get this type of response here. Now this is all due to fiber fracture, the fibers in the laminate being fractured. Now I've just drawn some lines on that to say that we get fiber fractures across the warp and weft directions. So all of this region here in these is due to fiber fracture. Now that's quite important, you'll see uh, in a minute. But if we just um, look at the, the scale force displacement traces, at first view, it looks pretty encouraging. They seem to fall reasonably uh, coherently one on top of the other. But if we increase our impact energy, and if I remove a, the quarter and three quarters traces, and just the, leave these two, then we start to see a difference. This is 148 in cube joules. Um, there, green is our n equals half, purple is our n equals one. And we see that this fiber fracture region goes on for much longer in the larger panel. And indeed, if we sort of 
crudely measure those fiber fracture lengths in both the X and the Y directions, and we add them together and normalize it by the length of the, of the panel itself. And we plot that against our scale size. So here we've got normalized crack length because the maximum value could be equal to two because we could add the warp and weft directions. We've got values above one. But anyway, what we find is as we increase our scale size, we get more and more fracture of the fibers we would hope and expect that these lines might be flat, getting the same response at all scale sizes. But what we find is we get more fiber damage in the larger panels. And I think it's because our fiber damage is scaling as, as an N squared term. These fiber fractures through the length, through the thickness, there's no uh, spread in the lateral direction. These are sort of two dimensional cracks. And so we're putting in this energy as a, uh, uh, as a, in a n cubed, but this I think is a, an n squared relationship here. So we're getting more fiber damage than we would expect in the larger samples. So we're not uh, getting anything like a scaled behavior there. Uh, we've used this approach to look at all sorts of different things. You can sort of get almost get carried away with it. These are some curvilinear structures I did with. Dr. Jin, who's on the uh, call here today, he did those. Um, whoops, I've uh, gone forward a bit too quickly there. Um, sorry, if I can just go back. Uh, there we go, it's going to stop there. And we've also used it to look at isogrid structures as well. Uh, here we made four different scale sizes of isogrid moles. So everything here is accurately scaled, the groove, the groove depth, et cetera, et cetera. And we infuse them using the uh, uh, vacuum assisted resin transfer molding technique with my colleague here at Khalifa, uh, Dr. Rahan Umar. And uh, we looked at the time to fill these molds to actually uh, produce these samples and we, to investigate how our scale size influenced the fill time. And once again, we saw that they, they didn't fill according to how we would expect them to. But one of the challenges making samples like this, especially small scale samples, is when you're cutting woven fabrics to very small size, they quickly disintegrate into your hand. And uh, so you end up putting something that really doesn't look like a woven fabric into these slots. And that changes the permeability and that changes your fill time as well. But in the larger uh, samples, this, the fill times were in accordance with, with what we would expect and how we'd expect that to scale. But again, these are our forced displacement plots. Uh, although you can't see because they all seem to be black in color. This is our quarter scale sample here. It doesn't behave terribly well. Uh, and that's really due to some of the problems that I mentioned earlier in the actual manufacturing. But the other four, three scale sizes do pretty well here. And uh, these are our fractured samples after testing. So these are really quite complex structures. But there's our n equals quarter. There's our n equals one. Um, this one here has got fiber fracture along the middle here. So has the large one here. You can see how the quarter scale sample, which is really you know, quite a small sample, it's got exactly the same type of failure as the large one. So I'm nearly done. Uh, but those are the last two or three slides now are on some of our more recent additive manufacturing work. Um, I'm not quite sure why my uh, lattice structures there have chosen to move and to obscure our EOS 404 printer, but if you use your imagination or go online, you can see what one of those looks like. That's our recently acquired uh, metal printer. Uh, it's got four lasers in it. Uh, it can print structures up to 400 by 400 by 400 more or less any type of metal uh, as well. So it's ideal for making larger components and structures. And these are some lattice structures we've made here. Again, different scale sizes, you can see them. These are a quarter scale, right there up to the largest there. And we also have a, a, a big uh, rep 3D printer in the research center. And we've used it to make these scale sizes of lattice structure that you can see there. And um, we've done some compression tests uh, on them and all sorts of different tests. We've done uh, flexural tests as well on scaled 
coupons and uh, compression tests as well. So these are uh, flexural tests here. Please excuse I, my legend has disappeared, but this is quarter, half, three quarters and full scale. But our flexural strength, there are some sort of uh, size effect issues as we increase our specimen size. Also with our compression strength, these are on various sizes, four sizes of compression sample. And I think this is probably due to the fact that we get defects in these samples. These defects are the same size in all of our scaled samples. So they have a greater impact in um, smaller scaled samples because their relative size is that much larger. And also the, 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 the edge, the, uh, the surfaces of our samples as well, that's likely to have a greater impact in our smaller samples than it is in our much larger structures. We had a, a layer thickness here of about 0.5 millimeters. And you can see these sort of, what are effectively sort of defects uh, on our surface. But nevertheless, uh, we tested our lattice structures as well. Um, we've got a, a couple of sizes here. I think these are the n equals half, n equals one. You can see the failure modes in them there. They're, they're very similar uh, as we uh, change our um, size here. And if we look at our scaled load displacement traces as well, there's a, a reasonably good degree of similarity, certainly in terms of failure modes, also in our load displacement traces. But again, there's a tendency for our larger samples to be stronger than our smaller scale samples. Uh, and once again, um, I think it's, uh, it's to do with the presence of these defects in our structures as we manufacture them. So uh, I'm out of time. Um, rather than finish with uh, conclusions, I have sort of got a general gist of, uh, of my thoughts as we've gone along there. I thought I'd just finish with sort of uh, recognizing and saying thank you to my colleagues over the years at Liverpool, um, some of whom are on the core here, obviously Zhang Wei and, uh, and Jin and Raphael, who spent some time there. Genevieve came from Liverpool, went to Cape Town, where I've had great contacts over the years. I think Gerald might be joining us today. Uh, Genevieve's come to Sheffield, of course. And um, finally, our friends in uh, USP and uh, also XJTU, Dr. Jin uh, Joe, who's with us today. So. At that point, I would like to, uh, to stop. Um, I'd had my 30 minutes exactly, I think. Uh, I think there's, if there's time for questions, Raphael will tell us, but I think they have to be sent by the chat button. But thank you very much, anyway. Thank you very much, Professor, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, so now we are open for questions. Uh, the questions in this uh, platform can be made in two different ways or typing your questions in the Q&A box or if you want to ask uh, the speaker live, you just have to raise your hand and then you allow the audience to, 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 to talk. You were showing it's a scaling, you know, with, with energy, the, the scalings are working. Would you expect the scalings to collapse at higher velocities when moment, you know, at one point, momentum will become dominant, the, the mechanism rather than just energy? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. There is going to come a point, uh, certainly at higher as one increases the velocity, where these things will break down, um, where you'll get what I would call a, a much more localized uh, impact response. And um, you know, yeah, these sort of scaling laws won't be uh, applicable. I think it will very much depend on, on your, your impact velocity. Also, uh, on the, uh, probably the mass of your impactor as well, exactly when that transition occurs. So, so basically my question really was, is there some kind of dimensionalist number, just like what you have been doing, which will characterize when these scaling laws will break down? Or is it just that, is that too complex? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you look at the work, I don't know if you know Steve Swanson, he did some very nice work on scaling many years ago, I think he's retired now, and he came up with a sort of a rule of thumb um, when these sorts of things, uh, uh, you know, when you will go towards a very much a localized 
uh, response and these sort of rules break down. If I recall correctly, his rule of thumb was once you are, it, it's based on the ratio of your, the mass of your impactor to the mass of your panel. And um, I was, yeah, I was going to quote a value there and I'm probably going to quote the incorrect one. But yeah, Steve Swanson has yeah, uh, identified that as a, as a critical parameter. I'm not going to quote the one that I thought it, I was going to say 10, but I can't, that can't be right. But yeah, it's, uh, he, he did very nice work where he uh, looked, uh, identified the mass of the impactor to uh, the mass of the panel as being a critical uh, ratio. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Cantwell. Actually, I'm proud, uh, one of his students. Oh, uh, one of my best <laughs> students, one of my best students. It's <laughs> great. Uh, a question, Prof. Uh, you show us all okay, all your uh, experimental results. Any uh, finite element or simulation result to show us compared yes, to the um, works? Yeah, quite, quite a lot. And uh, certainly on the uh, impact of the uh, composites to come fiber reinforced plastics. I mentioned uh, a very talented PhD student that we had, uh, Zewen, who has gone to Oxford University. She did quite a lot of finite element modeling of those plates and uh, was able to model quite closely that type of behavior. She was able to model failure and she saw um, size effects in her FE modeling as well. I chose not to include that today, A, because of time, and B, because uh, I know there are others talking here who might uh, <laughs> be showing that. But yes, yeah, so we've done some, some work uh, in that area. Thank you. Uh, Rafael, can I ask one question? Sure. Go ahead. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, well, Wesley, I would like to know, I mean, do you have any, uh, you know, any plan to do kind of uh, micro scale scaling effect? I talk about the metamaterials. Wow. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, I haven't. Uh, my mind hasn't stretched that far. But, uh, yeah. but in future, maybe, yeah? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, as I say, my mind is so limited, it hadn't even expanded to think about such things. But yeah, it's a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the questions. Unfortunately, you have to close the question okay. uh, for now. But any other question can be addressed direct to Professor Kanto or even to us, and then we forward it to him. Now, I'm going to leave the seminar. Or, uh, as Professor Kanto as chairman for now. Yep. Uh, if you need something, Professor, we're going to be here for supporting you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raphael.